I'm going to begin by just saying that there are some, there are, if you have a sense of humor and if you can sometimes take yourself a little bit lightly and, and not be too, too serious about our own history, there are some really funny things in church history because we've done some stupid things over the years. And when I say we, I'm not saying we were a part of it because there have been so many different movements within the church and those that are not even truly Christian. And so I'm, I'm actually talking about something within Catholicism for a moment this morning because Catholicism got so crazy during the Middle Ages that they would have debates over points of theology, things that they had things that they had come up with that they believed that were so ludicrous and so far out that then they had debates about the finer points of those things and it became just silliness. For example, angels being supernatural beings as they are, they argued about their dimensions and their size. And they had this ongoing debate about how many angels could fit on the head of a pen. On the head of a pen, because angels are supernatural, they could take any size or any form. And so this was a serious debate within the Roman Catholic Church about how many angels could accommodate, could the head of a pen accommodate. Just a crazy, crazy thing to be caught up in. Likewise, you know, we, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, and the Lord's Supper will be the end of this message today. But when we partake, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we, um, we know that it is something vitally important. And it is something where <clears throat> if our hearts are right, we encounter the presence of Christ in it. But it's not magic. And it is no more in one sense than a beautiful, beautiful symbol of the body and blood of Christ. It, it doesn't have powers of its own. You know what I mean? In Catholicism, the body and the blood of Christ are the bread and the cup. The juice or the wine literally become, this is what a Catholic believes, that when they receive the blood or the cup, the juice, and they receive the bread, it in their body, as they put it in their mouth, it literally becomes flesh. The body of Jesus Christ again. And it literally becomes blood as they partake of it. That's what Catholics believe about communion. They are feeding on the flesh and blood of Christ. It's actually an abominable teaching according to the Word of God. This isn't a message about Catholicism, but I, I wanted to begin with that because... Their debates then about the communion also became ludicrous. Because the question became, if a crumb of bread falls from the communion table, and a mouse eats a piece of the bread, does it become holy? Does the mouse become holy? Because the belief is that if in faith you partake of the body of Christ, you have taken Christ into yourself, and his holiness makes you holy. Makes you holy. And so I want you to imagine this filthy little mouse making his way down the aisle of the church. He's just covered with germs and diseases. And he gets down to the communion table and lo and behold, a crumb falls to the floor. And he eats that crumb. Does he become clean? Does he become whole? Does he, is he healed? Is he well? Is he Holy, is he sanctified? Is he set apart for God? Is he saved, in other words? Is the mouse saved? And I'm going to take that a step further. If all the people go home and the church is quiet, the mouse climbs up on the table with all of his filth and all of his germs, and he crawls all over the communion bread, does that holy communion bread become filthy and contaminated? Yes, it does. He spreads his germs and he contaminates the communion bread, the wafers. So as we spring from that for a moment, you're thinking, Pastor Mark, what on earth are you talking about? Just come forward to the last two years and what we have lived through because we've been very, very health conscious as we've dealt with a 
a, a sickness that has traveled around the world, and no debate about this that this morning. I'm not going into details about COVID, but let me just ask you some questions about that. If you go down to the hospital to one of the wards where the sickest patients are and you are so healthy and full of life and you go in and you just walk through, does your presence make those sick people well? Just by you being there, do they suddenly become well? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could all go down to the hospital this afternoon and I am not talking about the potential power, the healing power of God through laying on of hands under under His direction. That's not what I'm talking about. It's a different issue. But if you could go down and just rub rub off on all of those sick people and their germs would go away, their infections would go away and they would be healed. Wouldn't that be wonderful? But it doesn't work that way. Well, let's turn that around for a moment. If you go down to the hospital this afternoon and you walk into the rooms that have the most deadly infectious diseases, and you just get in the bed and rub up next to those patients, what most likely will happen to you? You will become infected. And those things will be passed on to you. Many years ago, some of you remember the story, the true story of the priest who went to Molokai Island, one of the Hawaiian islands, and established a colony there for lepers. And he ran that colony for years until he finally died. He, there was no cure at that time, and all he could do was treat them humanely and try to teach them about cleanliness to keep it from spreading and all of these things. But he built a facility where he housed these lepers and he fed them and he took care of them. It became world famous. But Father Damien... There in that leper colony, his health and his just his very wholeness did not make one person well through all of that time. But in the end, their sickness made him sick and he died. Now let's read Haggai chapter 2. We've been talking about things in the natural. Now let's begin to look at the spiritual principle. In the Old Testament, Haggai prophesies to the people of Israel who are rebuilding, seeking to rebuild the temple after they've been, people have been carried off into captivity for many years and Jerusalem is in ruins and now they've come back. It's during the same time as these other minor prophets that are prophesying during the time that the exiled people are returning and they're working in the land and Actually, during this time, a number of years have gone by. I think it's 14 years that they finally are so discouraged, they just quit working. It was so overwhelming, they quit working on the temple, and they just are getting by. And Haggai comes on the scene, and he encourages them with many good words, many things to encourage them. But there's also a a sense that the people have settled into this idea that they're holy because they're associated with the priests there. They're associated with the temple. They're holy because they're called the people of God. And so they don't they they don't really care about the things of God anymore. They're just okay because they're there in the land. They're no longer in exile. Now they are back in Israel, in Jerusalem. So they are holy people. Unto God. On the 24th day, verse 10, on the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, now ask the priest concerning the law, saying, Here is his two questions. If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil or any food, will it become holy? And the priest answered and said, no. Because according to the law of God, it it doesn't make anything else holy. No, first of all, just so you'll understand, what is he talking about? Well, there were were meat, there, there were meats and things that were set apart. They were devoted to the use of sacrifices. They were to be given as offerings. 
unto the Lord. And so they were holy. They were not considered unclean. They were considered clean, holy, set apart unto the Lord. And so if they were carrying it down to be offered or sacrificed, they were carrying it in the fold of their garment, in other words, using it like a, a, a bag or a basket, and it touches something else, does the holy thing devoted to God cause other things to become holy also? And the priest said, no. And Haggai said, if one who is unclean because of a dead body, and let me insert here, according to the law of God, the Israelites could not touch a dead body, or they were unclean. These, these laws, if nothing else, taught two things. Separation unto the Lord, <clears throat> but also they were health regulations. There were reasons people did not need to be touching dead bodies. And so... If a person touches a dead body, the law then calls them unclean, and they have to go through a ritual cleansing in order to be made clean, which involved washings. If one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these things, will it be unclean, the thing that it touches? So the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. So in other words, to sum this up, Haggai's asking them, he's confronting them with these two questions. If something set apart unto God and holy touches other things, will those things become holy? And the answer is no. But if something that is unclean, it's called unclean, and has been defiled, and the Lord calls it unclean or unholy, if it touches other things, will those things become defiled also? And in that case, yes, the answer is yes, it will. Because that defilement will spread. And we're going to work these two things, the natural and the spiritual, together for just a moment. And I'm going to be saying something a lot of different ways because I really believe that's what the Lord wants today. He wants us to hear it. These different ways until we get it in our understanding. So, there was the the sacrifice and the work that was taking place and Haggai is challenging these people with these questions. And after all that I've already said, let me say it in this statement. Fallen humanity cannot transmit holiness because what he's really talking about is people. Fallen humanity, sinful humanity, cannot transmit holiness to somebody else. You know, I, I know that you and I, we may think we're okay and we're clean before the Lord and praise God we may be. We're saved, we are set apart, we're devoted to the Lord. But let's use ransom, pick on him for example. Ransom can't just rub off on somebody at school without leading them to repentance. In other words, without them coming the same way that he came to the Lord. He can't just hang around with them and they become holy. Same with you in the workplace. Just because you befriended somebody and you walked with the Lord, just because they're in your presence, you may think you have a lot of influence, and you do, but they don't become holy just because they've touched you, just because they've been around you. Fallen humanity cannot transmit holiness, but it can transmit corruption, sin. Decay, uncleanness, and we'll understand that. Let me say it another way. Holiness cannot be passed on to another, but corruption can. Holiness cannot be passed on to another, but corruption can. It's true in the natural, and it's true in the spiritual. We cannot pass our health on to others, but others can pass their disease to us. Or we could pass our disease to someone else if... We had a disease. We can think that we can just rub off on somebody, but we don't just rub off on somebody except in one direction. We cannot rub off holiness on someone, but we can transmit corruption to someone. If I stood here before you this morning and I pour a glass of, if you just look this way for a moment, I pour a glass of filthy water into a glass of clear water. What is transmitted? Does the filthy water enter the clear water and the clear water cleanses the filthy water and now I've got 
two glasses really running over of clear water or does the filthy water enter the clean water and make it filthy? Yes. Okay, so the proximity of one affects the other when it comes to filth but not holiness. And I'll come back to that. I can't transfer cleanliness, but I can transfer filthiness, uncleanness, impurity. Haggai is saying you cannot be made right just by where you are and what you are doing. You can't be made right just by who you're associating with, people of God. You're not right with God just because you sit in a church service on Sunday morning. You're not right with God just because you sing the hymns or just because you go to an outreach and you're doing the work of God. You're not right with God just because you do any of these things or because of your proximity to them. You're not right with God just because you put a Christian bumper sticker on your car. You're not right with God because you go home and you have your Bible sitting open so that it looks like you read it all the time and you're close to it. You're not right with God because of any of these things. You, that's not transmitted to you because you're near something that's holy or you're in a situation where others are holy. Being associated with holy things or holy people does not make you holy. This morning you can be sitting in the midst of this little group and everybody else in here can be walking with the Lord, cleansed. They know their sins are washed away and they're walking with God. It doesn't make you one bit holier than you were the day, the moment that you came through the door. There has to be an inward work of God. Haggai was telling these people you need revival. Your heart needs revival. You have to have an encounter with the Lord. You have to have an ongoing work of the Holy Spirit taking place within your heart. You must be devoted to God yourself. And we'll see what that devotion means as we go along. There has to be a place of repentance where your heart is made right with God. And you have to come in faith giving yourself to the Lord. You have to be, in other words, not just near holy things. You have to be near the Lord with the right attitude of heart. The priest, in order to enter the temple, if you think about that, the priest would enter the temple to offer the sacrifices or to do the work in the holy place. The high priest would go in once a year to offer the sacrifice in the Holy of Holies. And Let's think about that for just a moment, those of you who are students of the Word. Did the priests just walk into the temple and because they were, oh, now they're in the temple and they are called priests. Now they're holy because they're doing a holy job? No, no they, could be, they could die in the presence of God if their heart wasn't right. They had to first offer sacrifices for themselves. They had to devote themselves to God. They had to have their heart right with God and be set apart for the Lord before they ever even entered the temple in order to do the work of the Lord in the temple. And so there were those sacrifices and rituals and things that they did, but those things didn't make them holy. Their devotion to the Lord was what made them holy. It's a simple fact. Sin contaminates, and simply being in church does not purify. Sin contaminates, and being in church does not purify you. It's easier for fallen humanity to infect. Listen to these words. It's easier for fallen humanity to infect than to heal. And we all know what Hollywood is like. So if you took a vacation and said, I want to go to Hollywood, I want to go to all the studios, and I want to go to all the movie sets, and I want to watch some things being filmed, and you just got the VIP tour of the century. And as a believing Christian, you went in, and you visited all those places, and you went in every studio, and you watched 
movies being filmed and you met the actors and the actresses and you shook hands with them and and you knew that you were right with God. You were you were holy according to the word of God because you're set apart, you're devoted to the Lord. And you went and you did all those things. You came home. When you turn the television on in the months ahead, you may be shocked to find you've not had one effect. The programming hasn't changed at all. It's still just as anti-Christ, just as filthy, just as bad as it ever was. You didn't do anything. All of your holiness did nothing. It was not transmitted to one thing or one person in Hollywood. But Hollywood, on the other hand, can continue to pour what it creates into the homes of believers who will willingly turn on the television set and watch the things that come into their eyes, ears, and into their hearts. And it's up to each one of us to discern, with the help of the Holy Spirit, what's appropriate and what's not. That's not what this message is about. My point is that you go into Hollywood, change nothing. The Hollywood coming into your ears and your eyes changes everything. It's a lot easier for fallen humanity to infect than for clean humanity, redeemed humanity, to affect the change simply by proximity, simply being in the proximity of someone else. You've all seen the example before where you have someone stand on a chair and they try to pull me up. It's a lot harder for them to pull me up than it is for me to pull them down. It's a lot harder for you to pull, pull anybody up that is for them to pull you down. You can't transmit holiness. But uncleanness is easily transmitted. Sin is far more contagious than holiness. Let me say it this way. To understand what it means to be right with God. It takes an intentional action. I want to define something for you. So just follow me. It takes an intentional action of devoting something to God to impart holiness. I'm going to explain that. It takes an intentional action of devoting something to God for that thing to become holy. I'm going to give you one example from objects, from things in the Old Testament. The temple was filled with golden vessels. They were used to transport ever, anything, but especially things like offerings and blood that was offered on the altar. There were gold vessels. Those vessels were sanctified unto the Lord. They were devoted to the Lord. That means they were to be given over to holy use, holy purposes. They were not to be defiled by doing other things, other uses. They were devoted unto the Lord and could be used for nothing else. Now, if someone just happened to go into the temple, this wouldn't have happened. But suppose a priest went in the temple and he carried a golden pot or something from his house. And he had it with him and he just accidentally left it in the Holy of Holies. It would not make that vessel any different than it was. The only thing that would make a vessel holy was if it was devoted to the Lord. In other words, of course, it can't devote itself. It's an object. So the priest devoted those things to the Lord. They anointed them with oil. It was a ritual that represented the presence of God on it because it's a picture of our lives in the temple of Christ. Our lives, we are those vessels in the house of God. And so it takes an intentional action of devoting something to God to impart holiness. The ones that were specifically devoted, not just because they are in proximity of a holy place, but because they've been devoted to the Lord. Speaking of you. Speaking of you, you are sanctified, set apart to the Lord because you've devoted yourself to the Lord. You've given yourself to the Lord. 
You have said, Lord, I want to be used in a way that honors you, that pleases you. I want to be a vessel in the house of God. Coming to church does not make you righteous. I know this is basic for some of you. Coming to church does not make you righteous. An inward work of devotion, which you know that involves that yielding to the Lord, repenting of sin, letting the Lord have his way in our lives, or, or, or we're not fully devoted, is what sets us apart and makes us holy. Proximity is not the same thing as transformation. You are not transformed simply because you are in the proximity of something that is holy. You are transformed when you devote yourself to the Lord. Now, the last half of this message has to do with what does that mean to us personally? How is that applied? And there's a huge area, but it mainly has to do with relationships. It mainly has to do with relationships, and this is where we're going to turn to a lot of the scriptures. Turn with me first to the book of Proverbs. We have three scriptures in Proverbs. Proverbs 22, verses 24 and 25. Just one example. It's not, it's not a, it really would be a great starting place, but that's where I'm starting. Proverbs 22, 24 through 25. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man do not go, lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. This is self-explanatory. He says, don't be in friendship with an angry person. Why? Because defilement can be transferred. And it's much easier to bring someone down than it is to pull someone up. And so they will affect you. They will affect your life. It will affect how you behave and how you act. And so he says, do not do that. Look at chapter 14, verse 7. Very similar, but instead of a righteous man, verse 7 says, go from the presence of a foolish man when you do not when you do not perceive in him the lips of knowledge. I want to just explain something to you because to us foolish means silly, doesn't it? But a foolish man in the Bible is not a silly man. A foolish man in the Bible, everybody listen to me. A foolish man in the Bible is any person who disregards God. The Word of God says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. That's what God calls the person who denies him. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It's the person who ignores God. It's the person who does things that are foolish, not meaning silly, but meaning dangerous spiritually. Things that cause them to be in in, uh, opposition to God, a wrong relationship with God. Go away. I want you to hear this this morning, because we're not used to hearing that there are certain people we are supposed to avoid. Go away from the presence of a foolish man when you do not perceive in him the lips of knowledge. Look at 1 Corinthians. I said there were three in Proverbs, but they're not. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts. Good habits. This is the kind of teaching we don't like to hear. But I'm going to be very clear this morning. There's a reason that the Lord had me bring this message. And when we ignore the things that God says, there will be repercussions for us. Evil company corrupts good habits. He doesn't say evil evil company corrupts good habits unless you happen to be a strong Christian. He doesn't say hang out with the foolish man or the unbeliever or the one who is against the things of God. If you're good and strong, then you'll be able to rub off on them. You can't rub off on them. You can witness to them. That's different from finding yourself having fellowship with them. You can witness to people. You may tell them what you believe. And you may love them according to the love of God that you would desire for them to be saved. 
but to simply run with them, to hang with them, that they would be your company because you enjoy it. That was, that's where you feed on getting your friendship. The Bible says that we cannot be friends with this world, this present world, the things or the people of this world. And so here he is talking about the foolish man, the man who is um, not right with the Lord. Do not be deceived, evil company. Always, you could insert that there, always corrupts good habits. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. I believe there are a lot of people that would like to have a good relationship with the Lord and go deeper with the Lord. Maybe they, they love the Lord, they're a Christian, but this is the one area they don't understand why they can't seem to progress when they find their fellowship with darkness. The Bible says, what fellowship can light have with darkness? Look at verses 14 and 15, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial, in other words, the devil? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? I'm telling you today that you will find that if you run long enough with unbelievers who disregard the things of God, it will affect your love for God. It will affect how the Lord is able to convict you and teach you and keep you close because you will allow your heart to become desensitized. They will, they will blaspheme the Lord. They will use foul language. They will talk about immoral things. They will do all of these things and have no regard for God. And if you listen to it and accommodate it long enough, your heart will grow hard towards the Lord. Do not be unequally yoked means don't, don't marry, don't go into business partnerships. You don't, you, you may, um, you may reach out to an unbeliever and you may be, you may help an unbeliever and you may love and, and care for an unbeliever in the sense that you want to see them saved, but you cannot make them your partner in something because then you are sharing spiritually in a sense. There are things that will come up that will cause conflict because if you obey the Lord, they are going to be in conflict with you. Look at 2 John. Some other kinds of people that we are to avoid. 2 John, that's toward the end of the Bible before Revelation. 2 John chapter 1, verse 10. See, the mouse isn't saved by the communion bread. Mouse isn't made holy because the bread falls on him or he eats it. But the bread becomes filthy because that foul little rat ran all over it. 2 John 1.10 If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. That's not just talking about the Mormon at your door. Even though a lot of Christians disregard this verse, it's not just talking about the Mormon at your door or the Jehovah's Witness because they come with a different gospel. Yes. And we're not to entertain that. We're not to give it the time of day. Unless God has, by His Spirit, like He did in the early church, unless He's given you a mission, unless He has, there's something that He has given you a word, something in order to speak to one, to try to win them to the Lord, but not to just sit and debate or compare notes or to enjoy their company because they're carrying a message of death. But it's the same thing. I want you to read that again, maybe a different way than you've read it before. It doesn't say if a false prophet comes to your door or someone from a cult. It says if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine... What doctrine? The doctrine that Jesus Christ is Lord and that He comes to save that which is lost. And that salvation comes by receiving His gift of salvation on the cross of Calvary. Turning in obedience, repentance and obedience to Him and following Him, submitting our hearts to Him that we might be saved. If anyone comes 
with some other doctrine or something different from that. We are not to entertain it if they will not hear the gospel. Now we have to balance that with other things the Bible says about family. There are people that you have to be in proximity with, whether they are lost or saved. There are times that you must simply show the love of Christ in the midst of a difficult situation, but that's still not the same thing as having your friendship and your fellowship with them. You still are to be a light, a witness. You're to stand out as a believer in the midst of unbelievers. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 11. Now most of what Paul is saying, he's talking about this shocks a lot of people. He's not saying that you don't have anything to do with unbelievers. He's saying that even with the unbelievers, you're going, you're in the world, you're not going to be of the world, but you're in the world. You're going to work with them and you're not to condemn them. You are to be a light to them to the very best ability that you can. But here he's talking about in the church, and I'm not going to read it, but just previous to this, no, go to verse 9. Because they misunderstood something he said in his first letter to them. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Now let's listen to this. He wrote them in a previous letter and he said do not keep company with immoral people, sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean the sexually immoral of this world or with the covetousness or extortioners or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. In other words, you're going to have to do business. You're going to have to live. You live in a world where you're going to rub elbows with people who are corrupt. But now, in verse 11, I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother. That means someone in the church that's called a Christian. That's right. Do not keep company. That doesn't mean you can't come to the church service if they're there. <laughs> Do not keep company. Don't find your fellowship or your friendship with anyone named a brother or sister who is sexually immoral or covetousness, in other words, greedy, or an idolater, idol worshiper, a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. In other words, anybody who's walking in sin, not even to eat with such a person. So he's saying you don't find your fellowship. You don't, when, a, when there's someone in the church, they know better. They sit under the Word of God. They hear the teaching of the Word of God. And they're in the church pretending to be a, a believer or walking, being called a believer, but they're living an immoral, opposite lifestyle. Don't hang out with them. That's what he's saying. Why? Because sin is easily transmitted. Yes. Corruption easily corrupts other things. And you think that you're strong and you think it won't happen. You think you can do these things, Nemo, but you can't. <laughs> it will happen if you disobey what the Word says on these things. Turn to Titus chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings, about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. In other words, don't argue about religious things with people. And then he says this, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition or warning, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. If you find somebody in the church that's causing division, maybe they're gossiping and they're setting one group against another group, or they're doing something that causes there to be division in the church. It's so serious that Lord says don't have anything to do with them. Because what you hear them saying, listen to me, church, if you listen, if you listen to people gripe and complain, it will find lodging in your heart and you will gripe and complain. If you listen to someone who's a fault finder, you'll start finding fault with everything. You'll hear them fault finding fault and it'll put that seed of, of uh, that same thought in your heart and then every time you look at those things you'll see what they're seeing and you'll say yep, they're right and you'll be a fault finder and it causes division he says don't have anything to do with them and last, no, two more scriptures so 
That's the end of those. I want you to turn to Psalm 101. Psalm 101, verse 3. This is David writing. David, a man after God's own heart. He said, I will set nothing wicked. King James, I think, says worthless. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. In other words, I'm not going to let it cling to me. I'm not going to be around it because I know that evil is transmitted and it will cling to me. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. And it would be the same with ears. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. In other words, those who turn away from the word of God shall not cling to me. This is a vow he's making. That will not cling to me. I will not let it cling to me because I am not going to be defiled by somebody else. What kind of evil things would he have been talking about putting before his eyes in his day? One of those things would have been idols. Anything that represents something that takes the place of God, that becomes a God in someone's life. He said, I'm not going to put that before my eyes. I'm not even going to look at it. But it would also be immoral things. I'm not going to put anything wicked or immoral before my eyes because it will find lodging in my heart. It will affect how I think. And it will affect my walk with God. So it's the same thing for us today. You know, I will will not put anything wicked or immoral before my eyes. I don't even have to explain that to you. You think that it means nothing to view things or listen to things that are abominable to God, that are filled with immorality. And that it's just entertainment. And it's not going to have any effect on me. Because the Bible says, while you can't transmit holiness to someone else, they can transmit a contamination of the Spirit to you. The things that they do can find lodging in your heart. And of course then you can repent and be forgiven. So I'm not saying that. But it's a real issue that affects every single generation that walks with God. Just being in church does not make you right with God. Just singing the hymns, even if it feels good to you, does not make you right with God. Putting an offering in the offering bag does not make you right with God. And let me just ask one deeper question. Not that I think this applies to anyone in this room, but this message isn't just for this room. And what do you think God's attitude is towards you if you're the one affecting some believer in an evil way? If you're the one that's leading them, you're the one that's transmitting corruption to them. Maybe you're gossiping. Let's use that for an example. Maybe you're gossiping about someone, especially someone in the church, and you speak it to another believer, and it causes them to think bad of that person. What do you think God thinks towards you? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18, verse 6. This is at first going to sound like it's just talking about little children. But if we, verse 6 is the verse, but I want us to go up and start at verse 3 so that we understand the context. Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, if you want to be saved, you've got to come with such simple faith. You're like a child. It's not complicated. You just believe the Lord because he has told you this. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The one who comes just humbling himself with the greatest simplicity, receiving Christ, that's the person that's great in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But he's this becomes a metaphor for something else because... The word calls us children. John, the writer of John, in in his little letters at the end of the New Testament, he speaks to the churches and he calls them little children. 
Because he's like a father to them now. And they are to have come like little children. We are little children to the Lord who come like faith to walk with him. In verse 6, our verse says, But whoever causes one of these little ones, what little ones, who believe in me? That's not just the little children that were gathered around Jesus. Now that's talking about you. It's talking about those who come to him in faith. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. That's how God feels about any who transmit their evil to one of his humble, believing children. Those who believe by simple faith. And I don't want to do this with any kind of arrogance because there is none intended. It's just the seriousness of this word and this message that I believe that it was from the Lord. And what if God sends a couple from Georgia in 1995 and they invest their life and their time bringing his word to an ever-changing small church group of believers over the years and they bring the true word, they bring a word that will tell people how to come to the Lord. Their family grows and they have quite a few family members who are part of the church who also hear that word, who sit under that teaching, who sit under that word. And that word says that the Lord calls for a people who do business with Him, who are serious about Him. And in the context of this service this morning, who have a word from the Lord that says, you are to separate yourselves from the things of this world that are evil. And you're not to corrupt yourself by entering into relationships where evil will rub off on you. Because you cannot rub your holiness off on them. And you are to separate from putting evil before your eyes and things that are going to corrupt your heart, lead you astray. You're not to hang out with those who are going to cause your your uh, devotion to the Lord to be tainted and not to be pure and not to be true. You're to guard that relationship with the Lord. And you're when you come together, when we come together today, it has our being here together does not transmit any holiness to you. You are only holy before the Lord if you're devoted to Him. What would He say this morning if that has been provided for you? All of these years. And then one day he takes them away or takes them home to glory. And you've ignored the message that he has brought, knowing that it's true to what's written in this word. And you're not guaranteed another breath of life any single day. We stand right now, as we are here in this room, we stand in one moment in eternity. And I want you to understand this morning, there is no more serious thing that could be happening in your life than this, right this minute. You don't have anything more important to do today. You don't have anything else to be thinking about in this moment that's more important. You don't have anything that should hold your affection or your attention more than God's will for your life. Amen. Some of you have lived for years and you just, you just go on and on and on and on. With no thought, and again, I'm talking to a broader group here than just this one. But with no thought for how many days am I going to just go my own way and not submit to the will of God? Others, others of you are saying in your heart, well, I'm young, I can deal with this later. I don't need to deal with this today. You wouldn't be sitting here today if God did not need young people and want young people that are alight that are submitted to Him. And that He offers you His own presence, His power, a clean heart, a wonderful future, everything that He can pour into you and give you. I don't know what else to say. That's what He's given me to say. I don't know how to convey it any more strongly. This is the hour. This is the time. That you... Enter into that relationship with the Lord that means something in your life. 
Will it affect you where you work? Yes, it will. I'm not going to lie to you. But who do you love more, the Lord or the people around you? Amen. And who are you afraid of more? If you're afraid of what they think of you, have you not really considered what God thinks of you and what He will say when you stand before Him? Sorry. He owns every minute of your life. Amen. And He calls it into account. You will give an account for it. Right now in this moment, He's saying, consider my words. Consider my words. As He said last week, what more have, have I not been good to you? Have I not been a good father? Have I not done what is right? You're not okay just because of proximity. You're not okay just because you come one day a week and hang out at Faith Harvest. For service and sometimes lunch. You're not okay because I'm your grandfather and Pastor Maggie's your grandmother. You're not okay because you attended Faith Harvest for many, many years. You're okay if you're devoted to the Lord. Devoted to the Lord. And that means that if you're devoted to Him, there are some things you cannot be used for. Set apart unto Him. The mouse is not saved by what follows from the table. How many mice crawl over your life and corrupt you. Your thoughts are on things that are not true to the Word of God. The inward work of the Holy Spirit is what has to take place in your life. He says over and over again, if you hear my Word, don't harden your heart. Listen to my voice and do not harden your heart. Amen. The longer you harden your heart, the harder it becomes. The Lord is urging, pleading with you today. I'd like for you to take your communion elements. Most of you take this every single week. How do you partake of it? Get them ready and then I want you to look this way. You partake of this every week. It does not make you one bit holier. It does not make you more right with God. You can't walk out of this place and say, oh, I take communion every week. My friends don't do that. No one else I know does that. You're not right because you do this. You're righteous if you come to this with a heart that's right. And if your heart's not right when you come to partake of it, he says, then get right with him first. Confess your sin to him, to him alone. And ask for forgiveness, for cleansing. Devote yourself to the Lord. Jesus, in a very real moment in time, not in a fable, in Jerusalem, some 2,000 years ago, stood at a table. And he took the bread and he blessed it and broke it and he gave it to the disciples and he said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Before we partake of the cup, I want to remind you, Judas was sitting at that table. That bread did nothing for him. He sat there all through the first part of the meal. He sat near Jesus. Somewhere at that table. Didn't change his heart. Didn't make him holy. Jesus took the cup. Said, this is my blood. Poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Drink all of it. He wasn't saying drink a cup. He was saying believe in what I've done and respond to me. Believe in what I've done and respond to me. And the Word of God, this is harsh. The Word of God says that if you partake of this with no regard for what it really is, what it means, that devotion to God and His sacrifice his blood sacrifice for you and what that means. You are eating and drinking condemnation against your own soul. Take it with a right attitude. Communion won't make you holy. And you won't make anybody else holy. But Jesus will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And it really is an amazing thing. It requires repentance and faith on your part. But then he does impart to us. He's the only one who can. Amen. He can just make us holy. 
We know what we've done. But we confess it to Him. We come in faith. We want, we devote ourselves to Him. We want to be right with Him. And He declares us not guilty. Amen. Not guilty. Amen. Nobody else can do that. That's right. Everyone else can defile others, but not make them holy. Father, I come this morning. Holy Spirit, I can only plead with you. You would touch every heart, Lord God, listening to this message. Lord, that we live in such a time that so many things defile us so easily. Help us, Lord, that we would separate ourselves from the things that take our heart away from you. And, Lord, that we would devote ourselves fully to you. And, Lord, that we would find our holiness that only comes from you. I thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us. I thank you for those here in this church and those who are listening and will be listening to this message. Today, Lord, don't let us leave here and just think that somehow we did something good and that we're right because we came to church. Help us to depend entirely upon you and what you did at Calvary for us to be cleansed. And we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty, holy, and wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen.